Stew that stew. Stew that stew. I was imagining a dystopian game show where someone gets killed if they don't stew a stew. Welcome to Cook Food Good, the show where I teach you how to cook food good and do other things good too, except really only the cooking part. So today we are making beef stew. It is a classic winter dish. It's warm and comforting. We're taking this nice big old hunk of chuck roast. For me, it's the best cut of stew beef. It's got a lot of kind of intramuscular fat running through it. If you're doing a long cook preparation like a stew, I like to have all that fat in there because it'll actually kind of melt out of the beef and make it nice and tender. If you use too lean of a cut, it might get kind of stringy. It's gonna be a little too lean to actually give you that unctuousness this is the unctuousness hand motion that you really want from it. We got some parsnips going there, some chipolini onions, and some nice red wine. It's gonna be really nice and good, but also good. Let's hack up this beef, huh? I'm gonna take the chuck roast and I'm gonna cut it into one inch cubes and then I'm just gonna put it in a bowl for later. I like to get all of my mise en place together. Mise en place is French for put in place. Uh-huh. Merci, Madame Keith. Poor la mm, Francais Don Lake Hole. I didn't learn that much apparently. When you're layering stews and thinking about the vegetables that are going in there, to me there's like two kinds of vegetables. There's a base aromatic vegetable and then there's the actual eaten vegetables, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna use carrots as like a kind of finer chop along with onions to create the base of that stock. And then I'm gonna use the parsnip and cipollinis. Cipollini onions are one of my favorite things to put in stew because they soak up so much that delicious flavor. All right, so now I'm gonna take some of that base veg. I'm gonna take my onion. You can really just rough chop it because these onions are actually going to cook for so long that it's gonna almost be like, imperceptible. They're kind of just gonna melt in your mouth. All right, onions down. You see, we're building the building blocks to our stew. It's like a set of connects, except I never had those and I didn't like the kids who did. I thought they thought they were better than me. So now garlic. Garlic's always a great thing. Some people might mince their garlic to put it in with the beef as it's sauteing. And I do love when garlic toasts beef fat, but I'm actually gonna leave the garlic cloves whole because I love that little like gem of just whole cooked garlic that you get when you take a nice big old spoonful of that stew and it's like, surprise, mother. The garlic was saying the F word, not me. So I'm just gonna take three cloves, two, four cloves if they're small, this is three, and then I'm just gonna take it. Palm heel strike, uh-oh, that one got away from me. And gentle palm heel strike. There's different power levels to palm heel strikes to open your garlic. All right, so we got our garlic peeled. That's going in a bowl. All right, parsnips. Why parsnips and not potatoes? I really like them, I love it. Like if you ever want to experiment with a new vegetable, a stew is a really great way to do that. Since this is an eaten vegetable and not a base vegetable, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut it into slightly larger hunks. So whenever it gets like extra thick here, I cut it in half. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the stem. And then with this, I'm not gonna cut it down the middle. I'm just gonna leave it in nice large chunks like that. But then for this bad boy, why do I call a parsnip a bad boy? This is like the least bad boy food of all time. I'm gonna cut it right down the middle and then cut it into chunks. That way we have somewhat even cooking. You don't wanna get like a mushy parsnip and an extra mushy parsnip. Now, carrots. Key for chopping carrots is you want the sharp edge of the knife to really run through the carrot flesh. Was that helpful to you? Do you feel like you can cook food good now? Thank you, I love you. All right, carrots going to the bowl, that's all done. Now, the only thing left we got to do is the most annoying task in all of cooking, and that is peeling cipollini onions. I'm gonna, that didn't work at all. Do you think I can put them in a bowl and shake them and they'll peel themselves? I can't hear, I, you're not saying anything. You speak up. I just, no, okay, now you're screaming, and I don't like that. It's gonna trim off the tip here. I'm gonna score it. And now it should be able to be easily peelable. Yeah, there we go. We got all of our mise en place in place and now it is time to actually stew that stew. Stew that stew! Stew that stew! I was imagining a dystopian game show where someone gets killed if they don't stew a stew. All right, so we got our beef chuck roast that's cut into one inch cubes. We got our carrots and our onions. We got our parsnips and our cipollini onions. We got some frozen peas that's all gonna go in the stew. We're starting everything off in this cast iron Dutch oven. This is one of my favorite pans to have. It's super cheap, costs like 30 bucks. It's great for stewing because it's what's called a heavy bottom pan. If you ever see that in a recipe, they're talking about something like cast iron or say very heavy stainless steel. And so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put just two tablespoons of oil in there. And you want the pan to be screaming hot because what we're doing right now is searing off the beef. That's gonna get some nice Maillard reaction. It's a technical term for it. The layman's term is brown food tastes good. And so we're gonna go ahead and get that beef seared off in there. We're gonna salt it to try and really kind of bring some of that moisture to the forefront. And you wanna place the beef parts about a centimeter apart. You don't want them to touch because you don't want any steam to create. Steam is the enemy of stews, just like turtles are the enemy of Mario, inexplicably. Sear it for about two minutes on each side. Oh, it's gonna get real smoky in your home. Sorry about that. If you got a fire alarm, just take the batteries out, put a hairnet over it. That's what we did freshman year of college for no reason. 
I'm just gonna take a little pinch of salt, scat that all over the beef. I'm gonna sear off the beef, then I'm gonna pull it. You get a lot of these brown, crusty bits in the bottom of your pan. That's called a fawn. When you're talking about it in terms of paella, the Spanish call it socarrat, which literally means soul of the pan. That's where all your flavor is gonna be trapped, so we're gonna saute the vegetables in that, and then deglaze it. But for right now, you're searing your beef. There we go. Don't be afraid of their smoke. You know what they say, when there's smoke, there's flavor. Write that down. All right, so this beef is nice and seared. The pan is still screaming hot. We're not trying to get a ton of caramelization on it necessarily, but we do want that high heat to get a little bit of color and browning on there. So I'm just gonna take the onion, the carrots, and the garlic. I'm gonna get that sauteing right in that beef fat. I like salting all the different layers because when you add salt to vegetables while they're sauteing, it's actually drawing out moisture. And so it's gonna get them to become kind of translucent quicker. If you see any sort of actual blackening happening on the vegetables, just pull the pan off the heat for a second, get it back on. But I would rather that happen than you get all that vegetable sweat at the bottom of your pan. And so now what I like to do is I take a little bit of tomato paste and a little bit of Dijon mustard. I'm just gonna add that to the pan because I actually want these flavors to caramelize a little bit. If you don't like mustard, you certainly don't have to add the mustard. And so I'm actually gonna take that pasty mixture and I'm gonna put it a well in the middle and I'm gonna saute it around. I'm trying to get a little bit of caramelization happening on that tomato paste. Now, as an important step in the stew making process, we are going to take red wine and we are going to deglaze the pan. That means you're using alcohol. I'm talking quick, this is burning. You're gonna use alcohol to pick up all those little crusty bits in the bottom of the pan. And so you're just gonna pour in about a cup. All right, so we wanna cook some of that alcohol out. This is getting nice and pasty. All those red wine flavors have really concentrated at the bottom of the pan. I'm gonna add three cups of low sodium beef stock. Uh, you could really also use water. And then as you cook this, the stock is gonna kind of create itself with the beef flavoring all that water with everything else. But for me, it's like, you know, they make pre-made beef stock. Might as well add that for a little bit of extra flavor. And now I'm going to add my beef along with those kind of juices that have leaked out. And as this meat actually cooks, it's gonna release some of the moisture that's inside of its meat flesh. That seems to be the term I'm working with. I'm gonna also add pepper. All right, so now that we have all of our aromatic vegetables in there and we have our beef in there, also going to take thyme. This is what the French call a bouquet garni. Technically that has like bay leaves and some other stuff in it. But I just take thyme and I use another piece of thyme to tie it as a string. And look it, now you got a little bundle of thyme. All right, so now that our stew has come to a boil, you just need to go ahead and grab a lid. I lost the actual lid, but you can use literally anything as a lid, as long as it's food safe. So we're just gonna let that cook for an hour and a half on low heat, and then we're gonna add the rest of our ingredients later, and I'm gonna finish that bottle of wine. I'm not, I don't drink at work anymore. All right, so the stew's been simmering away for about an hour and a half, and look at that, that's looking nice and stewy. <laughs> I don't know why I was surprised. Like I would just open it up and there'd be a whole chicken in there. All right, so now we have to finish it off. We're gonna add some green peas. It's one of my favorite ingredients to add to stew. It's something that I grew up eating. And then we're also gonna add our parsnips. And again, I didn't add these earlier because I don't want the parsnips to overcook. And anytime you stir it, it's gonna kind of break apart. I want it to be nice and whole and untouched. Nice virginal parsnips. And then we're gonna put in our Cipollini onions. Those to me are the real star. They soak up so much of that beef fat. Give this a nice little stir. Cook it for another hour. And all we gotta do is thicken it up with a little bit of cornstarch and then we gotta lop it into our bread bowls. So now we have to cut our bread bowls. I'm using a sourdough and rosemary boule. Ugh, yum, oh, am I right? Uh, just pick this up from any grocery store in their bakery section. I feel like everyone has this type of thing. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of trim off the top. I'm gonna go about a quarter of the way down and then we have to do surgery on, on a bread. We've done surgery on a grape, we've done surgery on a Pop-Tart, now we gotta do surgery on a bread. Great, and definitely keep this. This to me is the star. This can actually act as your spoon. That's what I do, I just curl it and go. And so now we need to actually hollow out our bread bowl. So I'm gonna take a small paring knife and I'm just gonna run a large incision around and just spin your cutting board. Always a good sign when your cutting board can spin freely on your table. And then you can just reach in with your hands and just rip out the bread flesh. Save your bread flesh for a rainy day. You know, uh, dehydrate it, turn it into breadcrumbs. Ooh, make a nice bread pudding out of the sourdough bowl. So now we have our bread hollowed out and I just wanna toast this a little bit just to give it a little bit more structure to it so we don't wanna get it extra soggy. And the great thing when you're using a baking sheet as a lid is that you can just toast your bread right on that sheet. All right, so now our stew is completely done. I'm gonna take out that little bunch of thyme and this is something that I really enjoy doing every time I make a stew is I check the seasoning by going. Oh, that's good stew. All right, and now the last step, you see there's a little bit of fat that has risen to the top of the stew. That is totally normal. What we're gonna do to kind of incorporate that fat in there and also thicken up our stew is we're gonna make a little bit of cornstarch slurry. So all that is is a couple teaspoons of cornstarch and a little bit of water. 
Get out of there, get out of there, you silly starch. And then we're just gonna whisk that together and then keeping the stew on the heat, we're gonna dump in that cornstarch. So all the starch in there is actually going to absorb the fat and sort of emulsify everything in. So you can already see this is thickening up immediately and it's kind of getting some of that fat off of there. We're gonna let this come back to a boil, finish it just to cook that cornstarch in there while our bread bowl is toasting for about five minutes. And then we're gonna fill her up. Fill her up, Scotty, so Star Trek. Hey, good news, our stew is stew now. Now all I'm gonna do, we got that bread bowl nice and toasted. I'm gonna take some of that stew and just slop it in there. I already spilled some on the plate, I didn't want to. Make sure you get a nice amount of liquid in there. Oh yeah, get some of those parsnips. To me, the star of the show. When you think of delicious autumnal root vegetables from now on, I want you to think of parsnips. Before you might've been like rutabaga, salsify, winter black radish, no, 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 parsnips. Brought to you by parsnips. Can we get that parsnip sponsorship? All right, there we have it. This is your beef stew bread bowl. This is super comforting. It's super easy to make. It only took me about a long time to do it. Um, but honestly, once you have the bones of the recipe down, it's super easy to kind of follow along and you can start tinkering with it once you have a good base. But for me, this is like the platonic ideal of just a nice comforting wintry beef stew. So I'm gonna go in and take a bite. All right, first bite of a bread bowl. I always take the top little muffiny part and I like to get it just soaking in there. All right, so this to me is the ideal first bite of a bread bowl. You got your little bread chips soaked in there. This is gonna be hot and I'm gonna <laughs> destroy my mouth, whatever. Mmm. If it was not 83 degrees in this kitchen right now, this would be the warmest, most comforting thing on the planet. It's honestly super good. You're getting all of that acid from the red wine that we cooked down with the tomato paste and the Dijon mustard. And to me, that's where all the complexity in this dish is coming from because anyone can just kind of sweat out some beef and get some vegetables in there. But it's those little tricks to me that really get the extra flavor in your stew. Well, hold on, I gotta do, I gotta do this now. You gotta take the soaked bread flesh and rip out just enough so the stew doesn't spill out of the levees. Why did I not think I was gonna be hot? What is wrong with me? I really hope you make this beef stew. I hope you learned something from today's video. Thank you so much for stopping by the Mythical Kitchen, checking out Cook Food Good. Tell us what other foods you wanna learn how to cook good down in the comments. We got new recipes for you out every week and new episodes of our podcast every Wednesday, wherever you get podcasts. Hit us up on Instagram, at Mythical Kitchen, with pictures of your food good dishes under hashtag Greens with Food. I'll see you next time. I'm gonna just eat this whole bowl of stew to myself, and then I'm going to wring out the bread bowl into a glass and drink the resulting liquid. Get as messy as you want in your kitchen when you have the Mythical Kitchen Towel. Available now at mythical.com.